Welcome to STEM Lab, where we discuss preparing students for success in a rapidly changing world. And here is your host, Michael Newsom. Very happy to have you here today with us on STEM Lab. Today I'm with my co-host, Crystal McGee. Crystal is a PhD in chemistry with a specialty in biochemistry. She's an instructor here at the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. Crystal, how are you doing today? I am doing well, Michael. We had an amazing lesson in class today. We were talking about cell communication, and the students were fascinated that cells communicate much like how we do, and even their communication is so sophisticated, it's compared to the types of technology that we use to communicate. So it was a great day today. Crystal, I remember one time we were talking and you mentioned that you had considered journalism in college. What made you decide to go into STEM? So that's interesting. Actually, one of my peers in college said that I should go into journalism, but I actually started off as an education major. Everyone in my family was a teacher or a principal or something like that. And so I always thought that I wanted to be a teacher and I do love teaching. But when I got into college, I registered for the wrong science course and I ended up in a chemistry class for science majors. But I loved it so much that I decided I definitely want to be a STEM major. And so actually I'm doing two things that I love. I love learning about STEM and I also love teaching. So this is the perfect profession for me. So at STEM Lab, we like to find guests and information to help STEM teachers, policymakers, and administrators. So Crystal, who did you bring for us today? I brought us Dr. Eric Wiebe from North Carolina State University. He's a professor emeritus there, and he has done some amazing research on developing game-based programs and virtual learning platforms for students who previously would not have been interested in STEM. I love that about this um, professor. And also, he looks at how technology being incorporated into STEM classrooms impacts the changes in STEM education for not only the students, but also for the teachers. And he was an amazing guest. He gave us a lot of great information about that. Hello, Dr. Weeby, and thank you for joining us here at STEM Lab. It is uh, such a, a pleasure to join you here today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Dr. Weeby, you are an accomplished professor in STEM education, and obviously we are so honored to have you here on our show. And you've done so many research projects and outreach programs in STEM. And one of the things that we're interested in is, tell us what do you think your greatest impact or accomplishment has been in STEM education? It's really hard to say. I, I think... You know, very much like most scientists, I find my work to be incremental and uh, contributing to really a larger body of work. So, you know, in as much as I have have impact, I think I've thought long and hard about how do we integrate technologies into instructional spaces. I've thought hard about both the cognitive, aka learning, uh, outcomes of those technologies, but it will also given a lot of thought to the affective dimension. That is, when does the emotional response of students to these technologies? How do we lever technologies to increase motivation, to increase engagement, to increase enjoyment of being in formal educational and informal settings? I've done in the last 10 years or so a lot of work on student collaboration, especially in younger grades. I think we've uh, been able to generate some really interesting insights on how do we use technologies to promote better collaboration between students when working on problems. Yes, I've seen that. You um, have developed so many virtual programs and gaming platforms for the student to learn. And you were saying that you really want to foster that enjoyment and also cognitive skills and, and learning. How do you actually measure that? So, you know, that work has certainly evolved over the years. We, you know, again, sort of social scientists, I think about uh, what kind of what kind of ways I can instrument a learning environment to collect data on students. We certainly have come to realize that from a temporal standpoint that emotions and affect 
really evolve over time and that if we're going to collect more instantaneous understandings of how students are responding to these technology environments, we need to find ways to collect and analyze that information, not just post hoc, you know, after the lesson is over, but also as that lesson unfolds. Uh, so that's everything from biometric data, facial recognition, heart rate, blood pressure, seat posture, how they sit in the sea, so that can be done both video and also through pressure sensors. All this sounds sort of exotic, but especially with the video information, increasingly we're able to capture and analyze that data real time. Also, a really important source of data is what we might call log or trace data coming from the computer itself. So how is the student interacting with the computer? What are they doing with their mouse? What are they clicking on? What are they typing? What are they, again, increasingly, what are they saying to the computer? All of this now becomes a little stream of data that, again, increasingly, we're using AI tools to try to analyze that data to under, understand really what both the cognitive and affective states of students are in the classroom. If all this sounds kind of scary uh, to some of your listeners, I think it's important to point out that as a researcher, I take issues of ethics and privacy as, as, as being of the utmost importance for immediate consideration. And so in parallel with the kind of work that I'm doing, we also have ethicists we're thinking carefully about how do we guard the privacy of individuals? How do we make sure the way that we are collecting, synthesizing, and understanding that data is to the best of our ability without bias? At the same time, understanding individuals and being able to, to recognize unique abilities and experiences that individuals have. Now, I understand the facial recognition and their posture, but how is it that you are measuring their heart rates? You know, we, we don't have to strap people up oh, and stick yes. things all over <laughs> their heart dust suit bases anymore. Uh, we really can put on wrist bug bracelets that are then Bluetooth to computers. So we can get heart rate. We can get, it's called galvanic skin response, basically kind of, we might call it micro sweating which indicates kind of levels of anxiety, for instance. Think, uh, you know, elements, what might go into a lie detector test? Uh, in this case, we're not really interested in truthfulness, but rather understanding the evolutional state of students. I, you know, at least in the near run, a lot of that sort of data is really triangulating data to hopefully provide confirmation that how we're analyzing, say, the video data or log or trace data coming into the keyboard and mouse is in fact giving us accurate information and or we're interpreting that accurately. So you don't imagine, at least I don't, going to classrooms where we're putting bit bits on all the kids and taking that kind of biometric data. How do you actually promote using your game-based and virtual platforms in order to collect this data? Are the games promoted as being something interesting and a useful resource for teachers? Uh, Game-based learning, some people call it serious games, situates itself nicely in contemporary progressive pedagogies in the classroom in that they can situate themselves nicely in problem-based learning, in collaborative work among students, in students being able to explore issues, challenges, problems that they find personally relevant, the customization of those game-based environments. Again, on the ass active front, we know that not all game motivating or interesting to all students, but that we find that for many students, and especially with increased customization, we can find challenging, doable but challenging environments where almost all students can find some interest and motivation in engaging with with those platforms. So I mentioned you said that sometimes some people are worried about privacy when it comes to trying to collect data on things, educational technology. Now, another thing that I face as being an educator is many of the teachers that I work with 
will always say that they feel like the implementation of more technology is actually leading to decreased cognitive skills. And also they worry about whether the student's academic integrity. Many of these things are concerning to educators. I, I, I truly believe that technologies, classroom-based technology in this case, are not a silver bullet, that, that they are a dual-edged sword, that there are ways that they can leverage and amplify uh, the capabilities and skills of teachers in classrooms, and there are ways it can be a distraction. So certainly a, a facet of my research has been around cognitive load, and when we talk about cognitive load, we, we talk about uh, both of those elements of cognitive uh, effort that uh, promote learning, that move learning forward, and elements that, in fact, are extraneous or distracting. And that holds for both teachers and students. And th and there's no question that badly designed technologies end up being a time suck. And, and this is uh, both uh, simply that they don't function well, so technically, for whatever reason, they aren't connecting to the network well. There's language it crashes, you know, those sort of typical terms. But also from a, a human factors user experience standpoint, they just simply aren't usable. And they may not be usable in part because they're just not well tuned for the particular context of that classroom. They aren't tuned to the abilities and interests of the students. It's not tuned to the abilities or interests or the goals of the teacher. There is a, a, a theoretical model uh, that's commonly used in our work called the technology acceptance model. And it looks to both the usability of the software, but also the utility of the software. And so the perceptions of the teachers around the degree to which this software tool is going to afford their learning goals for their students is really an important factor. Uh, we have to be concerned not only with the motivation of the students, but also of the teachers, too, because the teachers have to put in time and effort around professional development for using these technologies, bringing the technical aspects of that technology and utilizing it. And uh, quite frankly, there's often a quick tipping point. If they don't very quickly find this useful in the classroom, uh, unless somebody is meant, uh, it's out the door. <laughs> and and who can believe that time is time is very very valuable. I, I mean, people ask me, it's like, well, you know, human factors. I mean, that's a that's a field that looks at military applications and fighter jet pilots and astronauts and all these sort of you know highly dangerous mission critical types of applications. And I say, look, I said. Classroom, classroom is a high-performance environment. We need human factors just as much in classrooms as we do on spacecraft. Teachers are making decisions a mile a minute. How do we leverage AI, quite frankly, at least in the short run, to take care of some of the gut work in the classroom, answering the low-level questions that students are asking all the time, but suck up a lot of a teacher's time? How do we, how do we let the the agent on the computer help the students out those level questions so that the teacher be to now to make higher level, more strategic decisions about how lessons are unfolding in the classroom. This really, you know, that's what I'm shooting for, at least in the short run. Maybe sometime 10, 20 years down the road, we all have sentient agents in the classroom. We feel comfortable taking over the teacher's role. We are a long, long way from that right now. Well, Dr. Weeby, I'm not sure about other educators, but given the workload of the typical um, teacher or instructor, I do feel like most people would find that interesting if it were user-friendly and, like you said, something that wouldn't take much, um, I guess, effort for the teacher to start to implement. Yeah, I mean, you know, so imagine you're, you're in class. And you're staying in the back of class and you're scanning over your students and you're asking yourself, how many of my kids are on task? If they're off task, why are they off task? Are they off task because 
they really struggled with the lesson the day before and they just don't even know how to get started today? Are they off task because, I don't know, they're not getting along with their, their lab partner they're working with? Are they off task maybe because of sort of larger, bigger issues in their life? How do we build what we call student models? How do we build models of individual students that tell the teacher something more than simply what grade they got on the last lab? That can maybe inform you as to why they're off task. Or if they're on task, wouldn't it be nice to know what was it about the way you designed that lab that they, that somehow got the kids so much more excited about it than the kids last semester? So you form your lesson planning and your curriculum development work so you can do a better job refining and developing materials. So Dr. Weeby, before we end this interview, I want to ask, what do you think educators should actually be doing now to kind of help prepare them for these new changes? Well, uh, you know, certainly with my experience and interactions at the North, North Carolina School of Science and Math, uh, kids graduating from there are certainly capable of developing their own AI tools, running their own machine learning algorithms, doing amazing stuff. So, you know, it could be for uh, students at your school. There are probably many of them are taking computer programming classes already. They're already able to actually utilize uh, these algorithms and tools and do some really cool stuff with that. I think that there's every reason to believe that some of your students may in fact be the future developers of the software tools that teachers are using in classrooms. I think for a, a broader swath of future teachers, I think that flexibility, creativity, positive outlooks to what they want to achieve and how emerging technologies might help them get there. I know it's just somewhat of a vague answer, but I think all too often uh, teachers are reactive to technologies. They feel something is sort of being you know, shut down their throat or their or some vendor is telling how this tool is supposed to be used. And I think that during their educational process, they need more opportunities to develop skills, to think creatively about how to uh, research, acquire, and deploy technologies, because these technologies increasingly are very flexible. So we've seen Chet GPT sort of emerge in the last year. And one of what I find one of the fascinating things about it is that uh, nobody quite knows what it can do. Or how it should be you. It should not be used, right? And I think part of that is that we haven't been given the skills and training to look at these new emerging, highly malleable technologies and think creatively about how we can deploy them. And I think students and future teachers need more opportunity to think strategically about how they can deploy these tools. <laughs> Well, Dr. Weavey, it was so nice having you on and um, you telling us about all of the new exciting technology. Uh, the future is coming even faster than we expected it. So, uh, and it has really been a pleasure talking to you too. You know, Crystal, I got a lot out of that interview. I was really impressed with all of the work that goes into looking at student performance with different instructional technologies. I never really thought about that before. I also think that Dr. Weeby seems to be surprised at the speed at which things are moving. What did you think? I learned a lot as well, too, Michael. I learned about how they're actually collecting the data in STEM education, how they're trying to foster engagement and learning of STEM um, through all of this research. And one thing I really loved about what Dr. Weeby said is that the students that are in science education or STEM education today are creating the codes that's going to transform science education in the future. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you for listening. And remember, until next time. Keep learning and growing. You have been listening to STEM Lab, produced in the studios of the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. 